Welcome back to this series of lectures on metaphysics and this one is a continuation of the discussion of the Pythagorean discovery, what I've called the greatest discovery of the ancient Greeks, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, the greatest discovery of the, uh, the, well, what we would now call the irrationality of square root two. I want to give you in this lecture a second, maybe even a third proof of this fact. The second proof you might find a little less convincing. And the reason is that it depends upon an important fact about arithmetic, which is called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. What is that? It's the statement that every ordinary number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 10, etc., every ordinary number factors uniquely into primes. Factors uniquely into primes. So let's go through some. So 4. What is 4? It is 2 times 2, both primes. What is 6? It is 2 times 3, both primes. What is 10? It is 2 times 5, primes, etc. Let's go for a bigger number. What is 60? It is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5, all primes. All numbers ordinary our ordinary counting numbers factor uniquely into primes it's a fundamental fact as the as it's called you could be taught this by the way in primary school at any time they your teacher could simply tell you this i don't think they ever do not in my experience i wish they would but they don't there, was fun, there are so many right things wrong with the high school education of maths. Certainly the not telling students what is important and fundamental is one of those things. You might ask, for example, sensible question, well now that you know that there is such a thing as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, are there any numbers that for which the fundamental theorem of arithmetic doesn't apply? Yes, there are. They're called, they're ex pretty exotic, they're called algebraic number fields. Algebraic number fields. And for some of them, the um, unique factorization fails. In fact, it only succeeds in a certain number of cases. It's 12, I think. Um, but mostly it fails. So, yeah, there are important number fields. Very exotic. Don't bother about them if you are just hanging on to this stuff. Um, there are things for which it fails. OK, how do we use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic in our proof that square root 2 can't be a fraction. Well, it comes in in a simple way. If we go back to the equations that I put up in the previous proof, we find that we've got, and I think it's line 3, we've got m squared equals 2 times n squared. m squared equals 2 times n squared. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that if we have if we have such a fraction, that that will be the form in which it comes to us, which means that suppose that we were to take m, which remember m is an ordinary number, m squared has to have the m has to have a certain set of prime factors, and m squared will have to have those prime factors laid out twice. By the way. This is just an aside. 
That's how you can use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic to prove that numbers are squares and cubes and fourth powers, etc. If it's a square, then it will have the identical factors laid out twice. If it's a cube, it will have those identical factors laid out three times. So it gives you a shortcut to understanding how to prove that numbers are cubes and squares. That's important. OK, so we've got m squared is just simply a set of prime factors laid out twice. That's on the left hand side of the equation. Look at the right hand side. 2 times n squared. Well, n is again an ordinary number, so it has prime factors, again, laid out twice. But that's multiplied by 2, and that's another, for the right, for the right hand side, that's another prime factor, prime factor of 2. So whatever the prime factors are on the right hand side, we have to add one prime factor, namely 2. That means that because the prime factors on the for the square are an even number of prime factors, it's the same prime factors laid out twice, because it's an even number, an even number plus 1, which is the, the number of 2, the, that that number has to be odd. It's an even plus an odd. But we saw that the left-hand side is just an even number. It's the prime factors laid out twice. So it's an even number. So now we have that the even numbers, or an even number, equals an odd number. Left-hand side, right-hand side. An even number would equal an odd number. That means that's an impossibility. That means there can be no such numbers, m and n, whole numbers, such that m squared minus sorry, m squared equals 2n squared, that can't be satisfied. To put it another way, m squared minus 2n squared equals 0 has no solutions. That's another way of putting the same thing. m squared minus 2n squared equals 0 has no solutions in ordinary numbers. Now we know. So, that is this simple proof based on the fundamental theorem of arithmetic on prime, unique prime factorizations. Now, it gives us the same, we can summarize the same result. It's the same contradiction. An odd number can't equal an even number. So we can, we can summarize both of these proofs that we have, the one from last week and this week, as saying an odd number can't equal an even number. Therefore, we have the proof of the impossibility of there being such a fraction. Again, it's a proof by, by reductio ad absurdum, the reduction to absurdity. We assume that there is going to be such a fraction. And then we show by deductive processes that there can't be, that it's an impossibility. So we assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove, and we derive from it by strict reasoning, that's important, by strict reasoning, that our assumption leads to a contradiction. That's the reductio ad absurdum, reduction to absurdity. So our assumption leads to absurdity. Therefore, our assumption must be false. Therefore, the opposite is true. That's the idea of reductio ad absurdum, and it applies in both of these proofs that I've given you. OK, that is the fundamental idea of these two proofs. OK, now there's another proof a geometrical proof that square root 2 cannot be a fraction, and I'll give that next. Okay then, here is the third proof. It's the simplest of them all, but it does require a little bit of thinking about. This proof is 
appeared a couple of years ago by Tom Apostol um, in Math Journal. Anyway, right, here it is. Very short, very sweet. Here is the triangle again. Now, suppose we were to put our compass point at the top of the triangle and we were to take the length of the side, we set, put the compass to the length of the side and we swing the compass so that it intersects then the, um, uh, the hypotenuse. We then have put a point on the hypotenuse which is one unit in length. <coughs> Excuse me. Put a point on the hypotenuse, which is one unit in length. Now, suppose that this triangle is side one, both sides one, and the hypotenuse is, for the sake of this argument, we're going to suppose again that it's m over n. Now, we could make this triangle entirely a um, integral length because we can multiply the hypotenuse by n and we multiply the sides by n. Then we'll get a right angle triangle with two sides equal to n and the hypotenuse equal to m. It'll be an n, n, m triangle. Okay, now we've Taken, a, got a point on the hypotenuse that is one unit in, sorry, one unit in length. It was originally, but now we've multiplied it by n. Now it's n units in length. Okay. Now, from that point, we drop a perpendicular to the base of the triangle. And what we get is hypotenuse, perpendicular down to the base, and the base and the perpendicular down to the base is going to be um, it's going to be the same length as from the base point to that point of intersection we now have a new right angle triangle of the same kind as before which has the same units on the sides um, that is, sorry, it has units on the side that are equal and it has a hypotenuse. So it imitates the first triangle in a smaller form. But we said that the original triangle was in its lowest form. It was the smallest triangle which had these lengths. Now we have a new triangle which has smaller lengths we can take that triangle and make a smaller triangle and that triangle and make a smaller triangle ad infinitum. But there cannot be a descending series of numbers going on forever it would have to at some point stop. Contradiction. That contradiction, geometrical contradiction, may not have been what the Pythagoreans themselves had, probably was one of the other two, but nevertheless it's a short simple contradiction and put up here a picture of it so that you can see how it goes. It's a little bit tricky, I guess that's why it was discovered rather late by Apostle, but nevertheless it gives you a proof that square root 2 cannot be a fraction. Okay. No more proofs of that. All right, so leaving aside this, these proofs, I'm going to now come to the question of what kind of response was there in the Greek period? What, what was the response of the Pythagoreans to this, to this discovery? Because I've said it seems a monumental discovery. What did the Pythagoreans themselves say about it. Well, the legend is that it was regarded as a, an astonishing and fundamental and all-important discovery by them. But recall that they had this code of silence which they adhered to, and therefore it was against the code to 
let that proof out. It was one of the secrets, as it were, that they wanted to keep to themselves. I think that's a bad idea, but, you know, there we go. They wanted to keep it to themselves, but that didn't happen. Someone did let out that secret. Publish it or tell someone else. However, it happened. Someone did say it out loud to a non-Pythagorean. Well, thank God that they did, because if they hadn't, um, we wouldn't know about it, and that would have severely retarded our knowledge. Perhaps there's more that we don't know that has retarded our knowledge, who knows? So, it did get out, and much has been said about this getting out, but I want to read you the statement from Iamblichus, who wrote a life of Pythagoras, and this is what Iamblichus said of this. This is his, his statement about these matters. He says, Nor did they think fit either to speak or write in such a way that their conceptions might be obvious to the first comer. For the very first thing Pythagoras is said to have taught is that being purified from all intemperance, his disciples should preserve the doctrines they have heard in silence. It is accordingly reported that he who first divulged the theory of commensurable and incommensurable quantities to those unworthy to receive it was by the Pythagoreans so hated that they not only expelled him from their common association and from living with them, but also for him constructed a tomb, as for one who had migrated from the human sphere into another life. It is also reported that the divine power, capitalized divine power, was so indignant with him who divulged the teachings of Pythagoras that he perished at sea as an impious person who divulged the method of inscribing in a sphere the dodecahedron, one of the five so-called solid figures, the composition of the Icostagenus. But according to others, this is what happened to him who revealed the doctrine of irrational and incommensurable quantities. Well, the idea that this is what happened to the one who discovered incommensurable magnitudes, that has been repeated often. Now, I get exasperated at this, very exasperated. This story is almost never told without it being embellished in absurd and ridiculous ways. For example, it is said that the Pythagoreans themselves killed the one who revealed this secret, that they threw him overboard on a, ship, on a ship's journey. Now, it's repeated so often that I, I almost, you will almost certainly never come across this without it being misstated in this way, that the uh, Pythagoreans did this. It will also be said that they sacrificed 30 oxen to the, to the discovery of this, etc., etc., which is almost certainly again false. Note that this quote from Iamblichus does not say that the Pythagoreans killed anyone. It does not say that they threw this person overboard. It says explicitly that the divine power did this. That, not that the divine power threw him overboard, but that he was lost at sea due to the divine power. Now you have to remember, in this period, shipwrecks were all too common. Plying the Sea of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea was a dangerous business, and there were many shipwrecks. It was a hazardous business being a sailor, but there were lots of sailors and there were lots of ships. So the story is completely compatible with that, simply that the divine power, who was you know, 
you always attribute these things to a divine power, a normal shipwreck, a normal storm, the person who revealed the secret of incommensurable magnitudes was drowned at sea due to a storm, a shipwreck. That's it. That's the entire story. Okay, so let's put that aside. Now, I was talking a little bit ago about um, the ratios of papers and canvases for photographic and artistic um, endeavours. Um, and I said that these often followed the patterns of the original Pythagoreans, the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, the two by one harmonic, the, and also, of course, the one by one, the square, that's also a frequently found um, form for these. Um, where does square root two fit into this? Well, here is a piece of A4 paper. A4 paper is what Europeans use for their standard letter size. I know Americans use um, US letter, but Europeans have gone to A4 paper, A3 paper, A2 paper, etc. etc. Now, what is this? What is A4? Well, interestingly, it is if you take this as one unit of length, this is square root two. Now, you already know enough to know that it can't be exactly square root two because you can't pin square root two down exactly. So it's whatever the paper cutters can approximate to square root two. But this is meant to be square root two. In this way, the A4 paper arises out of the same um, idea of rationalization that was found in the French Enlightenment and that produced equal temperament, you recall. This, in some sense, is an equal temperament page size. It has the property that if you were to halve it, if you were to fold it in a half, which I'll do for you right now as a piece of origami that you won't forget easily. There we go. There it is, divided in half. Now, if we make this one unit in length, it's half of what it was before, the length was before, this is one unit in length, we'll call it one unit, then this would become square root two. In other words, when you halve these in this way, you fold them in two, you get the same ratio of sides, one to square root two. That means you can divide the paper, cut it in two, to get the smaller sizes. So you start off with a big size, fold it in two, to get, say, A2, fold it in, in, in two to get A3, fold that in two to get A4, fold that in two, you get A5, this is A5, okay? So that was just completing that little um, uh, idea about how these things appear in uh, page sizes and in paper sizes for photographic prints, for etc. etc. Okay, let me leave that topic. Now, you may have been thinking for the last two lectures, well, all of this is interesting maths, but what's it got to do with metaphysics? Well, I did say and warn you at the very beginning that numbers and the reality of numbers is a metaphysical question. But okay, there's more to it than that. What has this maths got to do with metaphysics? Okay, well, I'll try and answer that question now. Let's go back to the equation. It was three on the original proof sheet. I've just referred to it now. M squared equals two times N squared. You can rearrange that as M squared minus two N squared equals zero. And what it says, one way of thinking about what it says is, there, can you find 
a number m, which when you square it is, is equal to 2 times another number squared. Is there a number which is, which, is there a square which is twice another square? Is there a square which is twice another square? That's what that says. And the answer in your original proof is that there isn't and there can't be one. So we've proven additional something. We've proven in our original proof that there can't be a square which is equal to twice another square. So if we were to list the squares and we were to list all of the twice squares, two times the squares, there would be no matchup on those lists, on those two lists. There would be no matchup on those two lists. Okay, fine. Now, if we try to work out fractions that sort of approximate to square root 2, we can look at the list and we can observe something interesting about them. There are no matches on the list. There are no cases where you have the square equal to twice the square. There are no such instances. This means that m squared minus 2n squared equals 0 has no solutions as an equation. m squared minus 2n squared equals 0 has no solutions at all. But m squared minus 2n squared equals plus or minus 1 does have solutions. It has a lot of solutions. And if we place them, list them out as m over n fractions, then here is what we get. We get, firstly, 1 over 1. Then we get 3 over 2. Then we get 7 over 5, then 17 over 12, then 41 over 29, then 99 over 70. If we compare them to m over n, then what we find is that these, firstly, we underestimate by 1, so it's minus 1, then the next one is plus 1, the next one is minus 1, the next one is plus 1, the next one is minus 1, the next one is plus 1. But in each case, the denominators are growing. And so these fractions are converging over and under, over and under, but they're converging in. As the denominators get bigger, the fractions get smaller. They are converging in to square root 2, but they never reach it. They get closer and closer to it, but they never reach it. So, there is no fraction which will give you this, but you can approximate it. So you have here fractions, numbers, and unlimited fractions. Fractions that don't have limits, that cannot arrive at the limit of square root 2. These are the fundamental building blocks for the Pythagoreans. The Pythagorean, the fundamental doctrine of the Pythagoreans was that you have two things in the universe, the limited and the unlimited, the determinate and the non-determinate, the commensurable and the incommensurable. These two things are irreconcilable, but they must exist and they must exist together. That dualism was the fundamental doctrine of the Pythagoreans. Dualism was the fundamental doctrine of the Pythagoreans and also of Plato. It is a dualistic ontology. Remember that I said way back in talking about Parmenides that Parmenides' ontology, his metaphysics, was monistic, 
there is only one thing. For the Pythagoreans, there have to be two things. And these two things are related to one another. They're fundamental. We have mathematical assurance that these two things exist and they have to be somehow incorporated together in the world that we find around us. But they have to both exist. That is the basis of the Pythagorean metaphysics and ontology. It was based in mathematics, founded in the idea of what you can say and or can't say about square root of two, but they reproduce this also in other areas, the distinction, the dualism between the odd and the even. So they had this dualism not just in one thing, which was the profound discovery, but also reproduced everywhere, male, female, etc., etc. All over the place was they found these dualities. And Pythagorean authors always stressed these dualities. And when you come to Plato, when we come to Plato, we will find that these dualities appear for him as well, as we'll come to. Thank you.